Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Elvin always wants me to emphasize your because he likes to capitalize it all the time. If you've seen any of our work here at Ed Up, that's Elvin Steele capitalizes your because it's all about you, our amazing listeners, as you have helped us, um, I think, be the first higher ed podcast to ever cross 100,000 downloads. We're fast and furious on our way to 125,000. We stopped putting out like, hey, thank you everybody for the last 10,000 downloads because they were starting to happen really fast. And it was like, who the hell wants to see that all the time? So we thought we'd go to tw every 25,000. We'll let you know how we're doing in terms of downloads. One person that helps us get there is my guest co-host today. Um, yikes, yikes! Oh, that's the wrong button. <laughs> um, here he is, ladies and gentlemen. He has been here, we think, three or four times before. In fact, he was one of the first I think he might be the first guest co-host I had when I put out the call for guest co-host, Dr. Eric James Stevens, and he is founder of Translate America. Eric, what's happening? Uh, hey, Joe. I said Translate so happy. America, but Translate <laughs> Academia. You know, we can try both, right? Yeah. We can try work. Uh, no, thank you so much for letting me be here again. Um, I love having these conversations, and I'm excited for today. Thank you. Well, I always like having you here. You're uh, involved in academia. You have been on the faculty side, you've done ID. I thought you were just like the perfect guest host for our guest that we have today. Um, he is, uh, he, he is a visionary, ladies and gentlemen, he's, um, doing some pretty incredible things. I'm going to bring him in now. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Po Shen Lo, and he is a professor at Carnegie Mellon university and the founder at XP.com. Po, what's happening? Hello, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's very interesting to talk to other people who are interested in innovation. Well, you found two people that are very interested in innovation today. So we're going to be very uh, eager listeners, Poe. And I, um, I, was reviewing, I was reviewing your, uh, you have your own site, which is pretty good. And it's making me go back to revise my own site. Now that I saw yours, I'm like, oh, God, I got to get back to my site and update it. But you are all about math. You're doing so much with mathematics and mathematics uh, training and learning. Talk to us about what you do uh, with xp.com and the work that you're doing at Carnegie Mellon. Sure, I guess you found that they're, all my things are about math, but I think I'm going to start by rebranding math. You see, the problem is once you say you're a math person, half the people leave the room. <laughs> so, so what I like to say is I actually don't think about the kind of math that most people think about, where, where you might just think about like adding some numbers or some arithmetic or like balancing checkbooks. Does anyone ever do that anymore? Or making change? Uh, I don't do that. Actually, I think that the real power of math is that, is that it teaches you how to think. And so I'd like to rebrand math as thinking. That's really what we do. When you're in the university level, what you teach is thinking. And what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to bring that to earlier levels, bring that to middle school, bring that to high school, so that people can start to see mathematics for uh, as, as a subject where you, it's, it's just about a, re, a system of rules. It's, it's, a, it's a system of rules, but the rules are not just to remember. The rules are to put together in unusual ways. And then I just ran around using this as a, as a theme or as a platform to try to help more people in the world like to think. So that's why I do so a number math of Math is things. all about thinking and thinking critically. Oh, yes. It's very clear that my guest host, Eric James Stevens, is not proficient in math. Would that be <laughs> yeah I was really, um and, and the the uh, the last one of the jobs i had recently i was known as the math guy um because i dealt with data and i have i'm an english professor so like i'm in the same way like i tell people that i do english and the other half of the room walks out right um and it's it's, it's so interesting to hear you say that, that the core to math is critical thinking because it's the exact logic that i use with writing um and to just kind of like break down that barrier it's like, no, like there are other more important things that are happening than that intimidating thing that you're thinking of right now. How's xp.com? What, what is it? T talk to me about what it is. If I'm, if I'm out there and I find xp.com, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn math. I mean, they're the right words here. I'm trying to learn to be more proficient in math or to use math as a strategic learning tool for my development. When I find xp.com, what am I going to learn? What do you... What are you out there championing and, and how does it work? Oh, sure. So first of all, I should say xp.com, xp is an umbrella for all of the social entrepreneurship that I do around education. But the xp.com, you'll probably land there because maybe you just Google search for scientific fact. Actually, I'm curious. Now I'm on the computer. I'm just going to type. Uh -oh. you'll, hear some count you'll, hear, you'll hear some typing, scientific fact. What happens? 
scientific fact. That's right. Actually, if you Google for scientific fact, I don't know if you're in front of a computer, Eric, but like if you are, I, I'm actually kind of curious. If, if, you, if you are, I'm curious if it works for you are too. too. If you just here's Google my, for scientific fact, typing. what's on top? Uh, that was my backspace button. What do you see on top on scientific? I fact? am 100% impressed with your SEO right there. You're yeah. All right. number one right on the <laughs> top. One. So we, most people land on xp.com because we actually define scientific, scientific fact for the entire United States of America and about a thousand other key math and science terms. So the main point of xp.com is actually not to make money. If you go in, you won't find a single ad. Uh, Eric just said something about SEO, um, that's search engine optimization. And uh, what, what I found out is that uh, you get ranked higher on, on search engine optimization if your page loads faster. That's called having no ads. <laughs> Wait, that was an Beautiful. interesting sound effect there, right? right so what I said for, is- That was correct. Yeah. So, so what, I, what I said was like, you know, given that the entire purpose of this is just to help people be able to pick up math and science faster, and we are willing and able to make a website that loads instantly because we don't need to put a single ad on there, we could actually conceivably affect how the entire United States of America interfere, interfaces with mathematics and science. So you don't go to xp.com, you go to Google, you're, you're doing your homework and you just land on our website and then we teach hey, you the subject. Kids, it's the internet. <laughs> I, the internet um, works. that I think is just brilliant. Um, I love talking to people who see a system and how it works and then recognizing, um, like a, like a, a chink in the, in the, in the, in the approach and then exploiting it um, in a way that helps people is something that is just the guts. I have goosebumps right now. I love that you found that. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you. I mean, actually, I learned this the hard way. You see, at first I was like, I want to help people learn mathematics and science in some interesting way. And I was like, let's make a website. And no one went there. And then what we did is we, we said with our user experience designers team, uh, I, well, our main designer, uh, and we were like, let's figure out what people are actually doing. And we found out that the average American student, actually including me when I was, just searches the internet when you want to figure out something. So rather than trying to make a platform, we just said, let's just make the absolute best thing that anyone would want to go to for a particular topic. And so that's what xp.com does. But that's actually only, only a small slice of what I do. But you, you can sort of see like the, the philosophy here. It was around, let's try to get something that directly helps people, giving them what they want. And that's the, that's the theme of the bigger stuff that I do that actually, for example, even makes xp.com free. The, the bigger stuff that I do is how can you try to help people want to get education? How can you make people actually want to, how, how do you make them enjoy what they're learning? And so, for example, that's, that's even how we got connected here. We got connected here because I was working with outlier.org on their university level courses. That's not part of xp.com, but it's part of the entire philosophy of how could you try to make learning as entertaining as cinema. So can you, can yeah. you Poe, can you make it as entertaining as cinema? And, and, and if so, how do you, cause this is, this is, this is one of those questions that I think all instructional designers would instructional design is like this blanket term now to describe so many jobs within like this, this area of you know, it could be gamification, design, uh, uh, assessment, and you know, there's all these different areas in, in embedding gamification in education is one of those things that we're all trying to do because uh, gosh, who was I on? I was interviewing somebody and can't remember who it was, but he brought up, Oh, you know, it was, it was a uh, Paul LeBlanc from uh, uh, Southern New Hampshire university, president of Southern New Hampshire. He brought up uh, uh, video games is a true way to assess someone's learning. Like you try it and you fail and you fail and you fail. And eventually three days later or three weeks later, you're succeeding because you just don't stop trying. It's that, I don't know, embeddedness of gamification that we want to exist in higher ed. And it's just really hard to achieve. I mean, how do you get there? Wow. Okay. So I actually see, there's a couple of things I want to say here, which are all really interesting. So uh, interesting to me, sorry, I don't know if it's interesting to you, but, but, but the bottom line is like, I do think that the gamification part is very important, but I actually think a lot of people went straight to gamification and they might've missed another part, which is just called um, watching a movie isn't a game, but I watch it. Why? It's because there's, there are people in the world whose expertise is figuring out how to captivate your attention not through making you click on stuff and getting a few points, it's through human emotion. It's through proper lighting. It's through 
the the shot it's by it's mm. from the cutting so i will say i've i've worked a little bit with not not a little bit, I've, I've worked with people who do who do um, actual theater stuff and filming stuff and i i realized that what we do sometimes in the classroom is is the equivalent to just like walking on a stage and saying i got my phd that means that i know what to do <laughs> i'm not entirely sure if that's true but then by working with an actual professional crew you find that there are people who have no background in mathematics whatsoever but know better than they know way better than you where to put the lights and when to tell you now is a good time to face this way and i, I really appreciate working with these other other people with different talents wow true right if you're teaching in front of a class online or in person, Eric, you're on a stage. Now, you don't want to be the sage on the stage, but you still, you want to make your stage engaging, right? Absolutely. I, like when, when people ask me what is one of the most influential books um, that I've read about teaching, my go-to answer is uh, Steve Martin's autobiography, Born Standing Up, because um, he talks about like just the, the art of performance and just the way that he would create his, um, his bits. They were just, they were intricate. And I realized that the things that he was doing were the thing, same things that I was doing when I was trying to go prepare for a class, like going through the, the stories in my head that I wanted to share, the points that I wanted to, to make, and realizing um, that teaching is is performative. And, and I love this, like, because I think that you're right, that there is this urge, Poe, to, to like gamify and to, to have that interactivity when we can also just take a moment and realize that there is power in story um, and just being able to just just sit and consume something that's actionable um, is a powerful thing that we can do. Oh, absolutely. I, I should actually say I've, I've like a couple of different teaching styles too. I mean, one of my teaching styles, the one that I use when I'm actually in person is uh, is the teaching style called don't prepare for class. Uh, now, of course, I should be very careful not to say this too loud, given that you're broadcasting this and who knows, maybe there's someone at my university who's about to learn that I don't prepare for oh, class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's what I do. That's the style. And that's called fresh cook. And what, what I mean is that I actually spent over a year taking improvisational comedy classes. That was that was when I was older, actually. That was when I was, I was already a professor. I've been a professor for a while. That was because at some point I was working with a PR agency, which was trying to help us make math interesting to the masses. and. Uh, in the first meeting, they told me, you don't know how to talk to people. You need to go and take some classes. And so I, I, I Googled and I enrolled in every improv comedy class in Pittsburgh. So that was, a, that was a year when I was taking these things in the evenings, like maybe two hours uh, a week. That's when you know you're that. taking your job serious is that you go to an improv comedy club to g either get laughed at or make people laugh, right? Because you're just trying to create your, your whole like feng shui, your aura. Good for you. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it was it was well worth it. I mean, the good thing is that I could pretend to be a student. And so no one knew who I was. Uh, I, I tried to be anonymous and I was just like, hi, I'm just Poe. I'm here trying to be interesting. Uh, but what, what I mean is like once I learned this, it, it transformed my teaching. I never had to prepare again. And so so the, the point is like what I would do is I would just make sure I thoroughly understood the entire curriculum. And, and what I do whenever I teach in my university, when I teach math, is that I just go and say, hey, uh, today we want to learn this. Can you tell me how you do it? I know you don't know how. Suggest me anything. We'll go and try to figure this out together. And at that point, actually, the, the flow of the lesson becomes fresh cooked to whatever the students think might make sense. It's non-trivial because you have to know enough about the subject so that if they start going in a wrong direction, you can actually explain why what is wrong is wrong. I actually feel that's the non-trivial part. Showing why what is right is right, you just follow the recipe. But if you have people who are going on the wrong path, you have to like think really quickly on your feet to be like, well, why can't you do that? If that makes sense. Uh, I, um, what you're saying really resonates with me because this, this idea um, of learning, learning through negation, like learning, like learning what something is by learning what it's not and being able to come in and to have the, uh, lack of a better word, the control of a classroom to be able to say like, let's go and run and have fun on this path. But, oh, wait, let's, Let's recognize that this is a wrong path. And what are the signs? Like, how did we get to this point? So let me yeah. like, how, so this, this is really interesting. Like how, how do you incorporate these, these bigger fun ideas, right? Like that you have in your classroom, how are you incorporating them into some of these, 
these tech projects that you have going? Sure, sure, sure. So first of all, with the collaboration with outlier.org that connected us all, the way that that works is we, we actually have it where I'm teaching to a camera, of course. And so I was, I would, I would simulate being like, I, I think this is how a person might act. This is a person, what a person might think. So here's what I'll talk. And I, I mentioned that earlier because that was this dimension about the performance and the production quality. And I think that's really important. But there are other tech projects I work with that are not, not, not working with, 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 with that particular group where, for example, those are not teaching higher education anymore. That's teaching lower education. Uh, I, I've had the opinion that if you want to have more people be good at math, you need to start much, much younger. And at that point, what we do, I can tell you the latest project that I do, uh, we are using back to human emotions. We're using human emotions again. And I, I created a program for high school students and middle school students where we're finding the country's top math high school students who are really good at math already. And what they are short of and what they would like to learn are communication skills, or interpersonal skills, leadership skills, the ability to magnetize a crowd or to pitch a venture, venture capitalist or to convince their boss that they should do their idea. This is actually what I identified as a huge need for the country's top math students, which I know because I also coach the National Math Olympiad team. So I, I know about this, this, this whole ecosystem. There's like 10,000 people in the country who are brilliant at math and science and need that other thing, but there's no program that delivers it. So we made one that delivers it. And back to improv, we actually have them take improv comedy classes online arranged through, for example, someone who taught me improv comedy. And you know, you, you can't just learn theory though, you gotta practice it. So what's the best way to practice how to convince anyone to follow you? It's to attempt to talk about what you're passionate about math with people who don't wanna be there, which is people who are learning math. You see, if you can convince middle school students that this math class is super cool. You have mad skills. Hey everybody, head over to www.edipexperience.com, our website where you're gonna find all of the episodes that we've recorded categorized so that you can ensure that you're spending your time listening to the podcasts that are most important to you. You're gonna see the reviews of our podcast, the shows in our network, our partners, and a section on starter episodes. If you're new to the Edip Experience, listen to those starter episodes and get a feel for how the podcast has evolved over time and our impact in the world. www.edipexperience.com. Mad skills, impossible skills, but super good if you can do it, right? Because kids, right, isn't it a natural, if you ask most people, what was your least favorite subject? So many say math, right? Because it's hard. If you get behind, it's hard to catch up. Um, it's it's funny. It's almost like I don't know if you guys if you notice this Poe, but some people have a propensity toward a certain type of mathematics. Like I was great with algebra, but as soon as I passed algebra, I just couldn't. I just couldn't get up there with trig and and all of this stuff. I just couldn't handle it. And so I didn't do that well in math. I was more of but but I but I was great as a performer. I was great in sales and I was great in in. Um, you know, when I could get out there and sell a product, I was great at that. And then you come back to my professional, um, using myself as an example, then all of a sudden I'm in a professional environment, I'm ascending into greater leadership roles because of my personality and sales orientation. And it's like, oh wait, now I'm looking at this financial report and I have no stinking clue what I'm doing with this, right? So I've got to relearn math again. Now that I'm an adult, it seemed you know more practical because it was it was more practical because it was related to my business, right? And that's where a lot of people miss on math is where is it related to the real world? Do I really need to know x plus y equals you know z over q? Am I going to ever use that? And the answer is, in in some ways, yes. You just don't ever know that that's exactly what you're using, right? I. Like, this is what is really interesting because like, this is just hitting home for me, literally, because with my, I have uh, an eight-year-old, she's in second grade and her teacher, she, she said, Hey, like we had a little parent teacher conference and she said, your daughter is great. She's doing great with reading. She's halfway through the fourth Harry Potter book. She loves reading. And you know, it, it helps that she has two parents who are writing professors, right. Who also love writing and reading, but like the, the problem that I don't have as a writing professor is understanding the context of writing because it's everything is done through communication already. Um, it's already a very story driven thing. And the, here, the thing that I'm hearing is that you've isolated not the need to learn math, but it's the, and just like what, what Joe was just saying, it's, it's to contextualize math. 
Um, and so I'm, it's, I just love this idea that you are giving the people who don't need to know math or no, don't need to go out and learn it because they already know it, but you're giving them the context to go and be able to become even better at it, to become even more proficient at it. And it's just, it's such a different, innovative way to approaching this problem that I just, I'm, I'm sort of in love with. I'm geeking out over here. Oh, thank you. I mean, actually the reason why we are very excited with this, with this new model, this is again, this is for the, the kids. This is like middle school and high school is because it actually also addresses a teacher shortage. Because if you think about what's going on in the middle school and elementary school, there actually just aren't a huge number of people who are running out there to become middle school math teachers full time who really you know, did all of this stuff before in high school uh, and, and in college. And so what we did is we said, look, there's a, a huge number of people who are never planning to be teachers. But there's a certain stage in their life, two or three years, where they could benefit tremendously from using their passions and their skills to practice their communication while accidentally or at the same time teaching the next generation down. So instead of relying on them to you know, do it for a 30 year career, you do it for two years and then they go on. Of course, we still need real teachers. I have huge respect for, for, for professional teachers. I actually run professional development workshops for uh, K-12 teachers, but the problem is there just aren't enough of, uh, we don't have enough of them. And so this is just another way to add more people into this pool. So I think- Are you guys ready for- going. Uh, Eric, are you, are you ready for our mid-episode game that we like to play here at the Ed of Experience? Absolutely. Uh, Poe, are you ready for this? I guess I am. Go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is another episode of a Higher Ed Word Association. Poe and Eric, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say word, and you're going to tell me the first thoughts that come to your mind. All these words are higher ed related. You don't have to pick a direction, just whatever you feel. Whatever you feel. Are you, are you ready for this? Go for Maybe. it. Maybe. I'm going to hit the button again just because I feel official. When I do. <laughs> Poe, you're up first, Poe. The first word is assessment. Oh, I think of test. I think of boring. I'm sorry. I, I'm already showing, <laughs> showing my biases. But like, I think of test. I think of boring. I think of often standardized. And I think of um, not creative. I don't know if this helps. Eric, assessment. Um, uh, for me, I, uh, for all the same reasons that Poe just mentioned as opportunity. Um, I, I look at assessment like it's, it is an opportunity that no one's happy with it. Could it be better? I like it. Okay, here we go. Word number two to Poe. Here we go, Poe. Teaching. Oh, I think of performance. I think of inspiration. I think of comedy. I think of fun. I think of sharing knowledge. I think of helping the next generation. I think of impact. Eric, teaching. I mean, again, like all those words. Um, I, I would say for me in this moment, um, I would say longing. It's been a while since I've been in a classroom and I, I love being in a classroom. Um, and so it's been, because I, I love that performative aspect of it. Um, and so it's been sad not being in there. Poe, your next word is degree. Oh, this is interesting. I'm going to say, I want to say overrated, but I don't want to, I don't want to put it that strongly. Okay. So, so what I mean by overrated, is that I was going to say, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but but what, what I mean by that is like, of course it's important, but I think that sometimes people focus too much on it is, is, is I guess what I would put. Um, yeah, I, I guess the, that's, that's, that's my main word. My advice I always give students is like, okay, maybe I should be careful. It's like, yes, you should get a degree, but you shouldn't think that the degree is everything. Like maybe that's how I should put it. I do think it's important to get a degree. Eric, degree. Return on investment. Yeah, like do that research. Like you want that degree, that's super cool. Why? Like what are you gonna do with it? I like it, okay. Uh, last one to Poe, online education or online learning. Ooh, that one I'm gonna put as opportunity. That's opportunity. That's, that's like a wild west. That's how I see it. Uh, and I, I view it as like still in its early stages. Eric, online learning. I, yeah, I'm opportunity in that. And this is where I get excited about like the video game building and everything. Like, um, I think that online education is about to enter a virtual world. Um, and I'm, that just is fascinating to me. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of Higher Ed Worse, a- association with your guests today, Dr. Po Shen Lo and Dr. Eric James Stevens. There you go, guys. That's my mid-episode game that we like to play here uh, at Ed Up. I have decided that Higher Ed Word Association is like my new favorite thing. I used to ask about entrance music, and I would get a lot of great answers from my audio, from my guests on what song introduces them or what's their favorite song. But Higher Ed Word Association, I feel like, is this new thing. In fact, I'm thinking about doing whole episodes of Higher Ed Word Association, right? Because it's like on the spot, and you get the real, the real kind of grittiness of what we think about higher ed. You know, Poe, what do you think about the value of higher education these days? You know what's being questioned. You know what's out there. Kids, uh, I'm going to say kids and adults are wondering, should I go to college? Should I not go to college? Coronavirus is ending. What does that mean for me? Uh, you know, uh, uh, businesses are sending their uh, employees back to colleges and universities for professional development because of the battle for talent is real and so on and so on. What do you hear in at Carnegie Mellon? What do you hear from your, your, your class, uh, your performative uh, classes that you're doing in mathematics? And, you know, cause I, I, and I'm a two-part question. I would feel like the students in a mathematics program might be more serious about their degree because that's my bias on what a student in math must be serious. It's it's total bias. Right. Uh, But what do you see? Well, I think actually, I I mean, I definitely where I am at Carnegie Mellon, uh, people are very serious. They're they're trying to, they're trying to pick up skills, but that's sort of related to, I think what Eric was talking about. of like, why do you want the degree? What do you want it for? It's because it actually bundles in a lot of learning. That's really useful. So actually, even when I was in college, I, I was like, yes, let me get some degree, but what am I going to major in? That's not the most important thing to me. What's more important is what particular pieces of knowledge do I really want to get out of this only very short four-year experience? So I even advise students, like, it's, it's funny. I also advise students, you should go do a PhD. But the reason I tell them to go do a PhD is not so that you can write PhD after your name. It's so that you can escape from the real world for a few more years and just learn stuff because that's really interesting. So I think what, what I'm trying to get at is that um, the value of college is is that you can pick up all of these really interesting pieces of knowledge that you might end up being able to use someday and, and just take advantage of that opportunity. Eric, questions? I remember, just to kind of come on that, like I remember when I was deciding about whether or not I should um, attend university, um, I was asked, asked my older brother, I said, you know, what should I do? Because I was, you know, I was slinging cell phones at the time. I was making good money as a kid. Um, and I could see myself still doing that now in the middle of life. Um, and he said, he's like, Eric, you, you go to university to go learn universal knowledge. Like that's why they call it university. And then if you want to specialize in them, then go to grad school. Um, and I think that there, there is, there is value in that degree. Um, and I, I just, maybe you could just speak to this a little bit more, but maybe as my last question, uh, kind of throwing it out there, like, how do you recommend to your students to balance that concept of like, go understand that this is a larger experience that you are having and don't focus as much on the degree. Cause there, I had students in my freshman you know, or at, at the university where I taught, they were breaking down on orientation day because they hadn't picked a major yet and they were being asked to. Yeah. Oh boy. I'm sorry. I have rain upstairs. So, so that's the funny background noise. Uh, but, but what I should say is that, um, I guess I, we, I always have advice to people, you should try to take their classes from the most interesting people that you can find. And the, the reason why it's such a great opportunity to try to take those classes from these people is because you're right in front of them now. You, you have that chance. And the point is, if you try to do it later in your life, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to be super motivated to want to learn this particular thing without someone who really knows a lot about it, helping you to contextualize it and helping you to split through and explain all of these things. So I guess that's that's where general advice I always give people is, you know, you have some degree, you'll graduate, fulfill the degree requirements. But honestly, by the time you graduate from this university and add 10 to 20 more years, it's not going to matter whether you majored in business or whether you majored in accounting or whether you majored in mathematics. It will be your, your work experience that, that, that makes the difference. So hopefully what you've picked out is that you now have some understanding of how some pieces of this universe fit, fit, fit together and you got them by taking some classes from people whose rate my professors.com wasn't so bad. <laughs> what do you say to, what do you say Poe to, to teachers, instructors, professors, doesn't matter anybody that's in front of a class, whether it's in an online environment or an on-ground environment or hybrid, whatever, to get better at teaching, to get better at delivery, 
Is it to go take online improv to take improv classes? Is that is that the best piece of advice you have? Is it a combination of of things? Talk about like if you were gonna give your best single piece of advice on how to really engage a classroom. What what do you need to do? So I would say that the big overarching thing is to have empathy for who's sitting in that classroom and each individual person. So, so people come into my classroom with lots of different backgrounds, lots of different interests, and attempting to empathize with them helps a lot. When I was, when I was starting out at Carnegie Mellon, I didn't know what the student body was like, so I really tried to understand. You know, there are many different profiles of people who are sitting in my class. What do they want? After being here for about 11 years, I sort of know what the standard um, types of people we have are. So I, I, I know our student body pretty well. But that, that concept of empathizing with the person sitting there helps. But then the practical technical tip, yes, actually that improv comedy thing, I give that as my main advice to lots of people because many people don't think of that, that you should just Google for improv comedy classes in your city and just take them and be like a learner yourself. Oh, Eric, I feel, you, you I feel that, like Eric? you're just the math version of me, man. Um, Cause like, Eric, I mean, it's the, get in, you better go get yourself in comedy classes immediately. Oh, I know. I know. I, I should, I should. Um, it's yes. And right. Um, but and, yeah. and that's, <laughs> that's like, yeah. Right. Um, and so, um, but the, the, I think that the reason that my students um, enjoyed coming to my classes and I had those high ratings on my, my professor um, is because of that exact thing. I understood that this, this there was a human person sitting behind that desk that had problems that my, my class was not their biggest problem in their life. Um, that like, it was just like my presence in their life was a blip. Um, and that if there anything that I can do to help make their um, existence better, and in my opinion, it's learning these principles in this way, then I want to be able to do that. And so I, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed um, meeting you, Poe, and uh, I have a lot of respect for the things that you're building. So thank you for, for being here. I appreciate it. Sure thing. Poe, we've got two final questions for you. At the end of every episode, we um, ask these same two questions. Number one, what did we miss about you, Poe? What didn't we talk about, whether it's uh, your instructional techniques at Carnegie Mellon, the, the engagement of mathematics, the xb.com. What do you want to talk about? Take a minute to plug anything that you're doing, the social impact you're having. Talk to us about it. And then number two, what do you see as the future of higher education? Right. Okay. So I, it's, it's quite hard for me to answer, like, what is it that you didn't talk about that I do? Because I do a lot of weird stuff. Uh, but, but the thing is that I, I, don't, I don't have any one particular thing that I want to pull out at this point on this podcast. I would just simply say, if you like these kinds of things that I do, if you hunt around a little bit more, if you want to look, I'm happy to talk to you some more about a whole bunch of other topics. Because, for example, something I'll mention, which has nothing to do with higher education, I spent the last two years inventing a new way to fight pandemics. And that was using math. Actually, I don't know if you know this. I'll just say what it is. This has nothing to do with this particular topic, but we basically invented and made the only app in the whole world that helps you not get sick yourself during a pandemic, which is back to aligning incentives and driving a feedback loop because everybody else was making tools to help you not get anyone else sick. I'm basically saying, this is, this is what mathematicians do, right? We, we know that A minus B and B minus A are different things. So basically, if, instead of right, right, building things to help people who are dangerous stop being dangerous, which doesn't line up with human incentives. We help people in danger protect themselves. The whole thing is driven by selfishness. Uh, that, that's, that could be a totally different topic. But um, the other thing that you asked, uh, sorry, I missed the other question. What do you see as the future of higher education? Oh, wow. The future of higher education. I actually do think that there's this combination of, I think there will be more and more, more and more methods that make things more engaging, which is again why I was really happy to partner with outlier.org as they were working towards that direction. But I also think that there will be other interesting efforts to fill the in-person part of the experience. This is, this is something where I've, I've dreamed for a while that somebody will combine well not combine that you could be different companies, but there, there will be this way of learning in very interesting ways online. And then you'll just be living in Tahiti with like the, the people, like your teaching assistants and your dorm managers and whatnot, they're professional party people, if you want. You know what I mean? It's just like the, the in-person experience is like as wonderful as it could be combined with the most interesting uh, content delivery mechanisms. I actually think that's possible. Me too. Uh, Tahiti also hopefully is possible for all of us in the near future, right? Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of the Edip Experience. 
first of all, my guest co-host today, he's back. He'll continue to come back as his schedule permits. And as my schedule permits, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Eric James Stevens, you know him as the founder of Translate Academia. Eric, thanks for coming on again, my friend. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And thank you uh, for the conversation we had today, Poe. Uh, I'm going to follow up and uh, have another conversation with you because all of those things sound fascinating to me. Thank you, Eric. Looking forward to talking to you. And my guest, you heard, you just heard him. You've heard him this entire episode. He's smashed it out of the park, uh, making you want to immediately do a mathematical calculation on the piece of paper in front of you right now. That's how good he is. Uh, and he's funny. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today, Dr. Po Shen Lo. He is a professor at Carnegie Mellon and the founder of XB.com. Po, thanks for coming on the Ed of Experience today. Thank you. Real pleasure talking to both of you. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just add up. <laughs>